U.S. Farm Report, a rural area public relations program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area and others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces. And now here is the president of the Wilson County NFO, Mr. Herschel Ligon. Welcome to another NFO program from Nashville, Tennessee. The objective of the National Farmers Organization is to get its members a fair price for their meat, milk, and grain. And what we mean by fair price is we want a price that will cover cost of production plus a reasonable profit. No doubt you have recently heard that we're going to have to have high taxes to curb the cost of living, uh, going to get into inflation and uh, food is too high. Well, uh, don't think for a minute that the farmers are getting these high prices that you're paying for food in the grocery store. If we were getting those high prices for the food you buy in the grocery store, I'm sure none of us would be as heavily in debt as we are today. In 1964, the farmers of the United States averaged 3% on their investment and nothing for their labor. Right now, according to the net income, 62% of the farmers in Tennessee are in the poverty class. I ask you, is it fair that such a great percentage of the nations of the world's most efficient food producers, is it fair that they should be in the poverty class? Uh, as I stated, we're only asking a fair price for our production. We aren't even asking parity prices. Parity is simply this. We should be able to sell $100 worth of our production to buy $100 worth of what we have to have. Just for example, let's take the price of hogs. Today, well, the reason I won't take the price of hogs is uh, a lot of people think hogs are entirely too high. I don't mind admitting hogs have been a good price for nearly a year, but just take present day prices. Today, $3,200 worth of hogs will buy only $2,300 worth of a tractor. Now, it's easy to see why we're so far in debt because just a little over a year ago, that $3,200 worth of hogs would have bought only about $1,400 worth of a tractor. Uh, I have here uh, parity prices for what we farmers are, are selling today. Now, uh, these prices are, are true parity. They're not rig parity. And I'd just like to give you these prices. Uh, parity prices on cattle, finished cattle, is $41.80 a hundred. Hogs, $32.20 a hundred. Corn, $2.15 a bushel. Wheat, $2.81 a bushel. Oats, $1.12 a bushel. Barley, $1.82 a bushel. Soybeans, $3.58 a bushel. Uh, for you people who are in the cotton belt that are watching, 47 7 10 cents a pound for cotton. And uh, today we have a dairy program and I'll just give you the parity price that uh, the dairymen should be receiving. If they were getting parity, the dairy farmers in this area would be getting $7.91 a hundred blend price for their milk. As I said, today is a, is a dairy program, and we have with us a dairyman. He's been a dairyman all his life until October of last year. He sold out. He had a 700 acre dairy farm, and I'm sure he knew Darren, and he still knows Darren from one end to the other. He's former president of the Southern Kentucky Milk Producers Association, former director of the National Milk Producers Association. He is the John Deere dealer at Bowling Green, Kentucky. When we think of NFO in Kentucky, we think of Jim Thompson. Thank you very much, Herschel. It's indeed a pleasure to be your guest on this program today. I'm always very much interested in talking to a group of farm people. I think also that our business neighbors should become better acquainted with some of the farm problems that are now facing the American farmer, American agriculture in general, 
I think sometimes they fail to realize just where the food that they go down to the shopping center, down to the supermarket, each weekday comes from. I believe they've overlooked the fact of how many long, hard hours of toil and labor has gone in to that little package that they carry out by the counter. Yes, maybe sometimes they think when they pick up the ticket, the farmer's getting rich. But after all, he has been a God-sent blessing to those in every phase of business in the urban areas throughout the entire United States. I think today that if you'd sit down and carefully consider the situation that you would find that your food dollar that you're spending today travels quite a shorter distance than any other dollar that you spend. You only spend about 19 cents out of the dollar that you're earning today for food. And I don't believe that you could ask for the necessities of life much cheaper than that. You know, it's absolutely amazing to me that businessmen, civic leaders, educators, and even some of the clergy of our great nation have stood so idly by and watched this great period of erosion take place in rural America as it has today. Yes, I think many of us have even stood idly by and seen this thing happen in our own communities, and yet we have done but very, very little about it. I don't know, it seems as though that we are all afraid to speak out. So many times we come so involved in things around about us, we're so afraid that we might offend our neighbor. Maybe we owe a banker a little bit of money. Maybe he isn't in favor of our National Farmers Organization program. And we're afraid to speak out our sentiments so that we might be heard loud and clear. Yes, I think it really is shocking that we have done so little to help remedy or to even locate the cause or reason behind this serious decay that is now taking place. And I say now taking place, really it isn't just now, but it started some 10 or 12 years ago. I feel sure that many of you in our viewing area today can remember of selling milk, not too many years in the past, for $6 or better per hundredweight. I think that it's time that the American farmer, even though he's few in number, should stand up and be counted. After all, we go down to the downtown merchant, we shop with him, we Jew with him on the price of an automobile. We can walk out of that place of business and say, no, you're too high. I don't have to have that automobile today. It's just as simple as that, because the old car with a set of plugs, maybe a set of points, put on a set of tires, will go on several more miles. But when the housewife goes to that refrigerator opens that door and looks in there, and as the old saying goes, finds the cupboard almost bare, then it's time to wake up. She becomes alarmed, and believe me, about the second or third time that that small child goes across that floor, opens that refrigerator door, and doesn't find a little milk in there when he comes in in the afternoon, if he's been out playing, wants to relax, refresh up a little and cool off, then you're going to hear somebody holler. The one thing that we have to have, and I think that the American people in general have overlooked this fact, and that is food. I can't see why that the businessmen, the civic leaders of our great nation today has sat so idly by and let this thing become so nearly completely decayed as it has. As Herschel mentioned a few minutes ago about parity prices, I think if you'll take those figures, make a note of them, Go check your records, check with USDA, any, any phase of the federal government who puts out facts and figures that you want to, you'll find that those are correct. I don't want to take up all the time on this program today because I have here with me two other gentlemen who are down-to-earth farmers. I'll capitalize a little bit more as we go on through the program on my past farming operation. I almost feel like I should say a retired farmer, but maybe I better rephrase that and say a broke farmer. But uh, it's indeed a pleasure to have Mr. Mike Carter here on my left, who is from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. This morning was the first time I've ever had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Carter. But I have made my living in the past 20 or 25 years dealing with farmers. So it's always indeed a pleasure to meet a farmer wherever he's from, no matter what state. 
And I've always admired your great state of, of Tennessee, Mr. Carter. Also, to Mr. Carter's left, we have with us Mr. Carroll Upton, who is a real close friend of mine. He is one of our better farmers in Warren County, Kentucky. Carroll has been born and raised on a farm not too far from Bowling Green. He and his father have been lifelong customers of us there at the Pruitt Implement Company, John Deere Place. They have made our place of business their headquarters, so I feel that if there's anyone that I would know anywhere that would be qualified to talk to you today a little bit about the conditions that are facing the farmer in agriculture, Carol would be one. So I'm going to direct my first question, if I may, to Mr. Upton at this time. Carol, I will ask you, uh, how many acres do you and your father now operate? We operate about 510 acres, James. Now you see a 510 acre farm operation today, it just isn't a play job. You know, in the past, it's been considered, oh, well, the farming was a sideline. Just any old, uh, what you got might go along and be a good farmer. But today, agriculture has become so technical that really to farm and to operate 500 acres is a full-time job. Uh, Carol, I'll ask you at this time uh, to kindly elaborate a little bit on the principal type of farming operation that's being carried out on your farm today. We're strictly dairy, James. We milk about 70 cows now. We've been all the way from 15 cows up to 100, and now we're coming back down. Carol, you made mention there you'd been up to 100 or better, which I know that's right. I've been out on your farm numbers of uh, different times, and I've always admired the splendid operation that you did in the dairy business. Why have you dropped back down to 70 cows today? Well, James, we found that uh, expansion just won't pay in the dairy business today when you consider the high price you have to pay for more machinery, for more cattle, for labor. Uh, you just have to drop back to about what you can do and uh, try to get by. In other words, you don't believe that increasing in numbers with the additional cost that's incurred then could be a profitable operation today under the present economic conditions? No, sir. It just doesn't pay to increase when, when you're making very little or losing on what you are doing. Carol, I find that throughout the entire country. Most every place I go, I find many farmers that uh, have the very same thing to say that you have. I don't feel like that all the farmers are wrong. If it's just a matter of your operation or my operation, then it could be charged back to our lack of ability to profitably carry on this dairy operation. But I find that in so many areas that I don't believe that I could say that I could charge any of that up to you. Now I'd like to ask Mr. Carter a question or two in order that I might get better acquainted with him and that you and the listening uh, audience might also better know Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, where do you live? Murfreesboro, Rutherford County. Murfreesboro, Tennessee. That's, that's a good place to be from. Nothing like the hills of, of Tennessee unless it would be the hills of Kentucky. Uh, what type farming uh, do you carry out in your operation? Dairy farming, that's my sole income. And uh, I have, uh, at the present, milking about 30 cows. I have milked up to 50. And like Mr. Upton said, it just doesn't pay to milk that many with the labor situation like it is and the cost of machinery and I have to do milk just about what I, I can do myself uh, as a family unit there. I have a small place, only 90 acres, and uh, you can't afford to, to hire all this help and buy all the equipment it takes to, to milk that many cows on this smaller place. Mr. Carter, I am very glad to hear you make those statements. Uh, I thought all the small farmers were making money. I'd been told that only the larger dairy operations, such as Mr. Upton and some others that I know, were the ones that was in this cost-price squeeze. In other words, you would really consider 
your farm operation as the family type farm operation that we at NFO are striving so hard to save as that family type farm operator? Yes, sir. Uh, we, I, I think that the more, the larger you get, the more you stand to lose on, in this type of operation. Uh, you have, uh, if you if you got a small amount, you're gonna lose a small amount. <laughs> if you got a large uh, operation, you, you stand to lose more uh, in this large operation. I'll certainly go along with you on that uh, line of thinking, Mr. Carter, because uh, I know in our farm equipment business there that every time that we expand, we run into some additional overhead that we hadn't anticipated in the beginning. I have just about come to the conclusion that when you sit down and figure out what it's going to cost you to make an expansion, that you should add about 30% onto that figure for some hidden gimmicks that we fail to see in the uh, beginning. They just don't come out on the surface until after we've already stopped. Uh, who do you sell your milk to, uh, Mr. Carter? Sell here at Nashville. Nashville Milk Producers Association. You are a member of the Nashville Milk Producers Association. That's right. How long have you been selling milk uh, here in Nashville? Since 1951. Since 1951. Well, I'll ask you another question, Mr. Carter, if I may. How is your price today comparing with that of, say, all 54, 55, 56, along in those years? Well, in 1952 uh, and three, uh, I received for 4% milk, $6.40 a hundred. Uh, at the present, uh, Last month, we received blend price $4.99. And with that type of price, now that's been a, over 10 years ago. And with things, tractors and uh, all types of equipment uh, have gone up from a third to maybe doubled in price. But still, the farmer, place of getting an increase, it's an, a, a decrease in price in milk. Now, uh, you can take a string and pull it hard enough, let it go one way and the other man on the other end pulling the other end and it's gonna break if something doesn't give. And I think that the farmer needs NFO to help him get a price which is so badly needed. Mr. Carter, let's uh, do a little checking on those figures there that you have just given us. I believe you said $4.99 was your blend price for your milk last month. All right. I believe today that milk uh, is based on 3.5 butterfat test with maybe a six cent pricing deferential. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to be fair to the consumers today. We don't want an NFO for anyone to be misled into anything. We want facts and figures to be where they'll stand up in your own local community or in Washington if necessary. 4.99 on 3.5 milk, and I believe if we added six cents per point on the butterfat deferential, we'd come up with a $5.29 blend price on 4% milk today. And I believe you stated that you received $6.40 a hundred for your milk some years back. So that would still be a deficit of a dollar and 11 cents per hundred weight on milk, comparing prices today with some 10 or 12 years ago. Now, at the same time, I believe you mentioned that tractors and all types of farm machinery had almost doubled in price during that time. That's right. In 1958, I bought a tractor and I gave $2,950 for it. This old tractor is just about gone. It needs, I really need another one. But uh, I doubt, uh, I imagine I'll have to get along with this one. 
but uh, I went to see uh, what a new one like this one cost. And since 1958 now, that I gave $2,950 for this tractor, this same tractor sells for a little better than $5,000. Now that's uh, quite an increase. In other words, with the present price of milk, even though it might sound uh, pretty good to some people that are not into the dairy business, who don't realize what it costs to produce grade A milk today, you're still at a great disadvantage when you have to go into your local downtown merchant and buy a piece of equipment, aren't you? Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Carter. I have another question here that I'd like to ask Mr. Upton at this time. Mr. Upton, do you feel or do you think that rural and urban workers are necessary to each other or does one depend upon the other? James, uh, they definitely depend on each other because uh, we as farmers buy a great deal of the product of the city uh, or factory workers' labors. We buy uh, a great percent of the steel that, and steel products that are manufactured in the United States. The farmers in America buy as much uh, rubber each year in the form of automobile tires and truck tires and tractor tires as come out on all the new automobiles each year. And uh, we buy refrigerators, uh, which are steel. We buy, of course, automobiles and uh, the many other things that go into our economy. And there's uh, one other thing I'd like to bring up at this time, James, that I think we've overlooked here on this price situation. For the benefit of the consumer, uh, let's give the price that they would have had to pay for a quart of milk back in 1952 and three when we were getting six dollars and forty cents a hundred for milk you could buy a quarter of milk in the store for anywhere from fifteen to eighteen cents now this year when we're receiving around five dollars or a little better for our milk per hundred weight the quarter of milk in the store will cost you anywhere from twenty five twenty six cents so i think that should be brought out thank you very much carol that's a very uh, good statement there because we many times overlook some of those things and it is rather important to know exactly what the housewife is paying today when she goes down to the grocery and also just what the farmer receives, what portion of that price the farmer receives. In other words, you would almost classify the urban and the rural people so closely interrelated that you would almost say that they was as dependent upon each other as the first finger is to the thumb. Yes, sir. Well, I think that's exactly right because after all, even though the urban worker is there now in a factory punching the clock, maybe even uh, at this very hour, the very goods that he's manufacturing goes out into all the rural areas throughout the entire United States. And if the farmer's buying power continues to be completely paralyzed, continues to decay at the rate that it has in the past 10 years, I know and you know that that factory worker is going to soon have to hunt another job. And now just where will he go? I'm sure that in most uh, areas, it's very much the same as it is in my own locality. And that is that he uh, will not have a place to go back to on the farm. I would just like to mention a few things because I know that our time slips away rather rapidly on these programs. And I wonder that uh, if we can really understand the sad situation that we're in today, you know, if I were to make the statement, a barefoot boy with shoes on stood sitting on the street waiting for the parade, it just wouldn't make much sense to you, would it? Well, I think if we'll stop and analyze that thing, it might make more sense than you think. That's exactly where we're going now. We're still wearing shoes, but unknowingly, just how long or just how far we could go, I think that remains to be seen. And we are in rural America today, I think are in the worst uproar. There's more confusion than has ever been. We're so confused and so bewildered that we really don't know whether we are standing or whether we are sitting. You might wonder why I would make a statement like that. But even at this very minute in America, I think that you'll find that about 37 cents 
out of every dollar that is nationally speaking goes for federal, state, and local taxes. Now your next 20 cents will go for interest to pay on borrowed money. Then 20 cents will go to pay on the debt. Now that leaves about 23 cents. So I guess you might suppose that we aren't in too bad a shape or in too, more, too embarrassing a position even with that because that leaves us 23 cents to spend and we can buy food today for 19 cents out of that dollar so you've still got a little spend money. But the thing we have overlooked is the fact that this farmer now is putting in from 12 to 18 hours a day and I don't know how much longer that he can do that because even with the declining number of farmers that we had in 1965, we noticed that the credit administration loaned a record $7 billion. Now you think $7 billion, that's beyond me to comprehend such figures. But how long can we continue at such a pace? If I have the time, I would just like to bring some figures to you as to what it costs per cow today to be in the grade A dairy business. I think recently Hordes Dairyman put out a publication stating around $2,800. And I'm going to give you some figures from a local farm that I recently made a survey of. And I'm going to use this 400 acre farm and I'm going to put his land values at a very reasonable figure, $400 per acre, which is $160,000 that he has invested in land. 100 cows, I use a very low figure of only $300 each, which is $30,000 for cows. Replacement heifers, 50 in number, $7,500. Two silos, $8,500. Silage unloading equipment, feeders, which is necessary, $3,000. Bulk tank, pipeline equipment, and all it takes for the operation, about $9,000. Plus his farm equipment and other machinery of $26,000 to $28,000. We can come up with a total figure of, of $254,500 or about $2,545 that this man actually had invested. And these were figures that we sat down and went over and compiled. So I think in view of all that's been said here today, that we must not go out and face the future with fear. I think America is known throughout the world for having courage, for having intelligence, for having great imagination. And by doing this thing, we'll be able to find a solution for these problems, even as severe as they are today, and in the matter that they face the American farmer and as well as the urban people. And remember, all of you in urban America today are so dependent upon the farmer, the American farmer, that you really don't realize where your next meal is coming from. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Legion for inviting me down for this program. And for any additional information concerning the NFO program, please contact this station. Thank you very much. U.S. Farm Report, a rural area public relation program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and by others interested in seeing the farmer receive a fair price for what he produces. If you're interested in having more information about the NFO, send your request to NFO in care of WLAC Television, Nashville. Videotape production.